everyone. We want to welcome you to this month's Southern Utah Seniors Lecture Series. Today, we are lucky to have Britta Clark with us. Britta is the Director of Communications for the Better Business Bureau serving Northern Nevada and Utah. Britta attended Utah Valley University focusing on her degree in political science. Originally, she's from North Carolina and she enjoys writing, reading, and spending time with her husband and her rescue dog. So we are very excited to have Britta here. We know she's going to share a lot of great information with us. And with that, I will throw it to you, Britta. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm really excited to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen and then we can get started. All right. Okay, hey. um, is that looking okay? Can you see the presentation? Yes, can you see my notes or just the presentation? Just the presentation? Okay, all right, great. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, first, I wanted to give an introduction on the Better Business Bureau and what we do, as some of you may not be as familiar. Um, the Better Business Bureau is a private nonprofit organization we are an international organization. Uh, we have offices in, all over the United States and every state. We have some in Canada and Mexico as well. Um, I work with the people throughout Utah. So um, our Better Business Bureau uh, serves all of Utah and Northern Nevada. We work with businesses and consumers to strengthen trust in the marketplace. A lot of people know us for handling complaints, but we also investigate bad businesses. We track scams. Uh, and we work with law enforcement and government agencies. We believe, uh, we believe that you should be able to buy with confidence and that confidence stems from being educated on the way things can go wrong for you, namely avoiding scams and knowing what you're at risk for. So let's look at an overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Number one is everybody gets scammed. We, all, we often have uh, in our minds preconceived notions about who gets scammed, what those scammers look like, but the truth is everybody gets scammed. Uh, at some point in your life, you will get scammed. If you haven't already, you're pretty lucky, but it's also possible you've been scammed and you don't know about it. Um, Everybody, everybody gets scammed. And despite that, uh, there is still a stigma attached to people who get scammed. You know, that can feel embarrassing. It can make you feel like you're not very smart, make you feel unsavvy or a range of any sort of negative emotions. And when you feel that way, you're less likely to report. And sometimes even if you want to report where to go to report can be so confusing. And one of the things we're gonna talk about today is learning what makes us vulnerable to which kinds of scams. Having that knowledge will help keep you from losing money in the future. And knowing just how widespread scamming is can help you respond to family and friends that get scammed as well and can help you reduce this, the stigma. Because a lot of times uh, when our friends and family get scammed, we can say, oh, I, so we can say to ourselves, oh, I saw, I would have seen that coming. Oh, I would have never fallen for that. But the fact is, is that we're all susceptible to different types of scams. And scammers rely on you not saying anything to people. That's how they can trick so many. They can repeat the same scams over and over because people don't speak up. So scams are designed to either steal your money or steal your identity in order to steal your money later. They have all kinds of techniques to collect your personal information that would seem innocent to you. And once they have it, they can effectively become you using your identity to open accounts, get, they can file for your tax returns or get medical coverage. Uh, oftentimes they don't even announce themselves when they take your information. So you may think, oh, if I get my uh, information taken, I'll know because they'll call me and they'll ask me for my social security number, but they can take your information without you knowing. And because of that, it can take a long time to detect. Um, there are ways for you to make your identity safe after your information has been stolen, but of course, prevention is the best way to keep your information secure. And because you have to act so quickly, monitoring your accounts is really important so that you can recognize when your info has been compromised. Lastly, we're going to talk about making safe purchases online. There have been a lot more online 
uh, shopping scams, especially since the pandemic started, because we've seen at BBB a lot of people moving their shopping online. So people who normally would be going out to say malls or retailers or really anywhere are now uh, are now shopping online. And we found that places like Amazon are some of the most um, scammers use their name the most to try and take your money. So let's look at who gets scammed. One of the things BBB does every year is we put out a risk report, which examines scams reported to us over the previous year and all of the data that comes with it. In 2020, people aged 65 and older were 31.9% likely to lose money when exposed to a scam. The percentage is higher for the 55 to 64 age range at 44.9%. Uh, the median monetary loss was about $150. Uh, in our risk report, we also sent out a, um, a survey and we found that most people who were scammed lost time, lost confidence, and they lost peace of mind due to stress or emotional impact. We also found that over a third of those scammed lost personal identifying information. Besides age, gender also plays a factor. In 2020, roughly two thirds of the reports to BBB scam tracker were submitted by women. Overall, women do uh, tend to lose money um, more than men. So more often than men lose money, but when men lose money, they lose more. Uh, so the dollar amount that they lose is higher than the dollar amount that women lose when they are scammed. All right, so let's look at the scams susceptible, um, the scams that you are susceptible to. There are two categories of uh, age categories that we're gonna look at when we, when we examine what scams are you most likely to be targeted by and which ones you're most likely to fall for. So those are two different areas there. You have the scams that are most likely to come across your, uh, your screen or come across your phone calls or just that you are likely to interact with more. And then they're the ones which likely, which you're more likely to actually believe. Because um, there are a lot of scams that come by us all the time, but we might not, might not believe it. Like if you get an email from somebody claiming to be a Nigerian prince, you know, most likely you're not going to fall for that one. But there are some that you're more likely to fall for, uh, no matter how often or which other ones come across uh, your screen. Statistically, uh, on the screen here, if you haven't been targeted by one of these scams, you probably will be, or perhaps you already have been and just didn't notice because you didn't fall for it. Um, it I believe it is a matter of time. So the first category is ages 55 to 64. The three riskiest scams for that age range were romance scams, online purchases, and investment scams. Second category is ages 65 plus. The top three riskiest scams for them were first travel, vacation, and timeshare scams. Second and third are the same online purchases and romance scams. We will be talking more about online purchase scams uh, at the end of the presentation, but for now, let's go over romance scams, investment scams, and timeshare scams. So romance scams uh, are what they sound like. They prey on lonely people looking to connect with someone, usually online, um, through dating apps and websites and forums and any way that somebody can contact you online. They can take months to develop to the point where money changes hands. Uh, usually the time is spent building up trust with you. They want to learn about your life. They ask you questions. They get to know you and they tell you about themselves. However, they're telling you about a fake persona often. They're not who they say they are, or they're buttering you up, uh, almost grooming you to trust them and to, to fall in love with them, basically. Um, they, they ask about your life. They ask about your family. They ask about uh, your children or um, pets or things about your life that they know that you care about. They learn what you like and they adapt their personality to be the kind of person that you would fall, that you would fall for. And eventually they're gonna ask for money. It might be for a family emergency, a business problem, plane tickets to come see you, et cetera. And if you send the money, they will continue to ask for it and find new excuses about how you need to send the money for whatever reason. Um, most of us are willing to send family members, those we care about, friends, uh, money for things if they really need it, because we trust and believe that they are the kind of people 
who would not lie to us because we've spent so long building a relationship with them. And this is made easier for scammers thanks to online dating. If you never see their face, if you never meet up in person, um, you know, it's really easy to craft a whole entire persona online that, that can fool even the most uh, savvy of people. Next, we have investment scams. Um, this can be anything. This can be cryptocurrency investments. This can be um, a business investment uh, into new inventions, into new projects, anything like that. They take advantage. The, the idea is to take advantage of people who want to make money with little risk and little investment. So they come up to you and they say, oh, my cousin has this uh, business uh, that he's starting and it's going to be really lucrative. Um, his father did the same thing and they made millions. And all you have to do is pay 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, whatever it may be. And the reason why older adults fall victim to this scam is because they have more time and more disposable income as they get older and uh, retire and uh, start collecting on um, in, uh, benefits and things like that, that retirement accounts and all that kind of thing that uh, comes when you after you retire. So they convince you uh, often with complex and detailed stories, and it can take years for many people to realize that they that they were scammed because you can say, um, yeah, you're investing and you should see a return in a year, in two years, in five years. And, you know, by that time, they've disappeared. They've, they've strung you along somehow to believe that you're going to eventually receive these benefits that they promised you, um, but you never do. And sometimes, I mean, by the time you figure it out, it's they're, they're gone in the wind. You know, they're, they've taken your money and they've run. Um, they convince you to invest in a project, a company, uh, to give them a loan or another initiative. Um, and, and you have to be careful about those because it's so hard to be sure of what you're going to get. Then we have timeshare scams. Um, that really what I said about the investment scams goes the same. You invest in a timeshare vacation house or they offer you free cruises or free tickets or discounted tickets um, or vacation rentals like Airbnbs. Um, are also a place where we see a lot of these scams. Uh, the deals are often too good to be true prices um, where they say, send you a beautiful house uh, online and say, um, yeah, you can stay here for $50 a night or something like that. And um, without ever seeing the house before, how, how would you know? We've had reports of people who show up to these homes, knock on the door, and somebody lives there who has no idea what they're talking about, no idea how the person got their information, and they were never renting out the vacation home or anything like that. So as you've been listening to those explanations of those scams and what they are, uh, remember that we're mainly going to be talking about focusing on identity theft here. So take a moment and consider, how easy would it be for a scammer to get your personally identifiable information through a romance scam? Pretty easy, right? They have to just ask you, oh, what's your family? Oh, who's your mother? Um, you know, tell me about your job or your what you used to do, it can really easily, you know, shift into conversations about information that you would never normally give out. And what about investments? How easy is it to get your personal identif identifying information for an investment? Might somebody give you a contract where you have to fill out information with your first name, your last name, your address, contact information, possibly they could, I could see a scammer convincing someone that they need your social security number um, or any of that personally identifying information. And then we have timeshares, which is the same thing, uh, filling out contracts, signing to who knows what. Uh, a lot of times we get so excited we don't necessarily read through these contracts and you give them personal information, you give them money, you might give them even access to card information or banking information. And remember that I said a, min a minute ago that over a third of those who get scammed lose personal identifying information. So every time you're targeted by a scam, you're at risk of not only losing money, but parts of your identity too. 
So let's talk about how scammers get your information. We all share a lot of information online, whether it be through scams or not. Think for a moment about your online presence. Where do you have accounts? Where online is your personal information? Just think about that for a second. You might be thinking of the obvious like social media, Facebook especially, very popular. And social media is designed to help you share your life online. You might also have thought about online accounts for banking, tax information, and other services where you have accounts. But then there's also considering private information stored not on the internet, but on computers like your phone. For example, you might put passwords in your notes app or on a digital document, in your email, your text messages, uh, even your calendar might have information there that you wouldn't want to get out. And those things might not be online, but as far as your phone is concerned, you take that everywhere. And if you lose that, somebody could get into it and access all of the information, all of the data that you keep stored on there. With the exception of, with the exception of probably the banking and the government websites, none of these sites are as secure as they seem. And even with the banking and the government sites, we see on the news all of the time, uh, people having data breaches and customer information getting sent out in spreadsheets to people, um, selling your information on websites that, that you might have accounts with through online shopping. And uh, you're more likely sharing more information publicly than you mean to. Uh, you may have heard it once that or you may have heard that once something is on the internet, it can never truly be deleted. And you should always believe that to be true. There are websites that automatically archive everything posted, uh, but beyond that, somebody may have seen something you posted, downloaded it or written it down. Um, you can post a photo and somebody else can download it uh, on, on so sites like Facebook. They could take screenshots and they can keep it. So if you want to post about how you got your vaccines or something like that, you might want to post your little card. It has uh, your name, your full name. It has medical information on there, uh, you know, that you have had your shots. It has the location where you receive those shots, which is something that uh, somebody looking to steal parts of your identity um, could use against you. One thing that I don't think people realize is that scammers do not need much information about you to steal your identity. There have been reports that we have gotten before of people stealing identity from just knowing your mother's maiden name. That is a common security question that is asked. Somebody could call up, they could know your name, your mother's maiden name, and they could say, the bank, they could call your bank and say, I need to switch or I need to add another account on there. Or, I lost access. And um, we see it happen time and time again where you only need a little bit of information. And, and think about where is your mother's maiden name listed? You know, it ha what, how easy would that be to find on Facebook? So we have to talk about keeping your information safe. You have to treat your personal information like money. You have to value it and protect it. You wouldn't just give money to anybody who asked. So you need to do the same with your private information. It's okay to limit how and with whom you share your information. A lot of the times I think we feel pressured to tell people what's going on in our lives, uh, to overshare on social media, but you don't have to, you don't have to be as open and you can still keep in contact with people and you can still share your lives with people without sharing things that could expose your identity. You can set your privacy and security settings to your comfort level. Um, a lot of times on sites like Facebook especially, um, there's an option to share your profile publicly. So that means that literally anybody find, could find your account and look at everything you've ever posted. Um, you can change that to share it with only friends, but then you need to be careful about what friends you're adding. Don't add friends that you don't know. Don't add people who seem suspicious or are duplic duplicate accounts of friends that you already have, because um, those could be imposters. Those could be people looking to uh, steal your information. Um, imposters often get information about their targets from online interactions, and they can make themselves sound a lot like family or friends because they know so much about you. 
um, your friends' accounts can get hacked. I'm sure some of you have gotten messages before, maybe talking about a government grant or some amazing opportunity uh, where you can basically get free money from the government um, and you just have to click this link or whatever and you get it in a Facebook message from somebody you maybe haven't heard, of in a, heard from in a while. Those things should be red flags. Uh, also, you gotta make your passwords long and strong. So you wanna use passwords with a combination of upper and lowercase letters, numbers and symbols, you don't want to use the same password for multiple accounts. You need to keep your passwords written on paper and stored somewhere safe, like a lockbox or hidden somewhere that isn't in plain sight. Because again, if you keep them written on your phone, that's what my mother-in-law does. <laughs> she keeps all of her passwords in her notes app. Um, and if she ever lost her phone or if somebody ever uh, got into her phone, they could find all of her passwords and they could take them to all of her accounts because she keeps it very neatly written. You know, she says what the account is for, what her username is, what her password is. And it's not as safe as it feels because that information is sometimes also stored in the cloud, um, which can be accessed by hackers or by people who, who can log into your email or if you leave your email open you know they can access your cloud information so written on paper is always the best option um, of course there is a chance that somebody will walk in and steal your special password notebook um, but that is so much less likely to happen um, and if you keep it stored somewhere safe uh, it's very unlikely that they would get to that unless they were specifically looking for it but um, that feels very rare um, you don't want to hide it in plain sight, obviously. So if you, but you don't want to hide it somewhere where you're going to forget it. So you want to, you want to keep them safe and secure, written clearly in uh, pens, so that they can't smudge or get erased somehow. Because you also don't want to lose your passwords. Um, you don't want to use obvious passwords, so don't use things like your your date of birth, uh, your mother's maiden name, any important number like anniversary, social security names of your children, birth dates of your children, um, anything to do with, with your identity. So uh, the best password is a random password, a string of letters and numbers that have really nothing to do with you as a person. Um, the hardest for computer, for hackers to get to are random strings of letters uh, with numbers included in there. But, you know, there are only, 10 digits, right? You have zero through nine. Uh, whereas with letters, you have the entire alphabet. So if you were searching for a combination, it would be much harder to get a combination from letters versus from mostly numbers. And I'm going to show you a slide here of the most common passwords. So take a second to look at this. And if you see your password on here uh, or any password similarities, you're going to want to change that. We want long, long passwords, uh, as long as you can remember them, as long as they will let you do. Some websites, I think, max it out after a certain amount, but you need to have a long password. It makes it so much harder to guess. All right, and then the authentication tools. So sometimes I'm sure you've logged into things like Gmail or Facebook and they have options to do something called enable a two-factor authentic authentication. Does that sound familiar? authentication. The two-factor authentication is something that will text you or call you or email you in addition to putting in your username and password. And that can get annoying, but usually they don't do it every single time you log in, just on a time you log in on a new device or if you log out uh, specifically and then log back in. And what that does is Basically, you have to have something on you. So in order for somebody to hack into your account, if they have your username and password, they still won't be able to get in unless they also happen to have your phone or they happen to have access to your email. So it creates that extra step, that extra buffer uh, to protect your account. Um, you can also use firewalls, anti-spyware and antivirus software to keep your computer safe and you want to keep those up to date. There are free versions of this um, through big names like Windows. Windows has, it's called Windows Defender um, and I believe it's free or it should come with your Windows uh, when you buy a, a laptop, a, um, a Windows laptop. 
Um, but you also have to be careful of tech support scams. So a lot of us aren't super tech savvy. I know I'm not. And sometimes we see pop-up ads or we see, uh, we get phone calls from people saying, your computer has been hacked. You need to give me a call. Like I need to, if you want to get your computer clean, I need to be the one to help you with that. Those are called tech support scams. And we need to we need to be aware that those can happen. And so if you hear somebody talking really technically with a lot of jargon, uh, computer stuff that you don't understand, um, hang up, call back on a number that you trust. If you need that kind of help, that's totally okay. But you wanna make sure you're doing your research to find trustworthy people who aren't trying to just take your money and take your computer hostage. The next one is a big one on not clicking unfamiliar links. Uh, this is this is called phishing with a PH, uh, where they send you an email or, like I said, a Facebook message, and there will be a message in there with a link that says, oh, click this to win uh, or to claim your prize or whatever it might be, and it has a string of, it can have a short link that's like really small or it can have a really long link, but in any case, don't click on links that you're unfamiliar with. So if you look at that link and you don't recognize the website, don't click it. Um, never click on links that in unsolicited emails. Instead, type in a web address you know, because if you do click it, you could be giving up your computer. You could be um, giving somebody remote access to your computer so they can come in and take over it. Um, if you don't know a web address, like if somebody sends you a link to, let's say, okay, so we saw this a lot uh, with the, um, with all of the COVID, uh, the money that the government was giving people. I can't think of the word for some reason right now, but um, you know what I'm talking about. Like when they uh, sent out money for people to uh, relief checks, like relief aid for, for people. Um, we saw this a lot where, where people would send out a link to say, claim your government assistance money or whatever. And um, all you have to do is pay a, $200 fee and then you get $5,000 or whatever it might be. And they would send out these links and it would take you to a website that looks really similar to the, to the official government website. And people would put in their credit card information and they would lose money and they would get scammed. So if you are, if somebody sends you a message like that, because, you know, theoretically somebody might do that, that isn't trying to scam you. They just want you to read something that was posted on a government website or whatever. If they say, look at this, that was posted by the IRS. And if you see the website and it says irsforfree.com, that should be suspicious because the IRS, their website's really easy. It's irs.gov and all government websites are going to end in .gov. So if you, you have to look at the, the web address, the link that you're about to click and make sure that it looks familiar. And when you do go to look it up online, if you don't know the address, for example, if you get something from the IRS and you wanna to check to make sure that the link is real, but you don't know the real link, what you would do is you would just open up a search engine and you would type in say IRS, but what you need to do is skip past the ad. So let me actually show you what that would look like. Maybe. Let's say we're gonna look up the IRS. Okay, can you see that, my Google? Okay, so you see right here, it says add. You don't wanna click that, because look at that, irs.com. We know the IRS ends in .gov. So you wanna look right here and see, this is the official, the official website. If we click this, it could be, most likely it's not necessarily a scam, but what it is most likely is somebody trying to get you to think as much as possible that they are the IRS and they will ask you to pay for a service that's free or they will maybe even take your identity, take your money or whatever. So that's why you have to be careful about uh, what you look up online. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so then we have, we've talked a little bit there about, about online information, but you also have to be careful about your physical personal information. So when you throw away your personal information, you need to shred it first because it might shock you. It did for me the first time I heard of this happening. Uh, thieves will rummage through your trash looking for bills or other paper with your personal information on it. 
The same goes for throwing away or giving away old computers or phones. You need to make sure that when you do that, you wipe the device of all of your private information. Um, so the next thing is, is that you never want to send money to somebody you have never met face to face. Just don't ever do it. Just consider that something you will never do. And really, really don't do it if they ask you to use a wire transfer, a prepaid debit card, or a gift card. Those cannot be traced and are as good as handing somebody cash. So you need to be really cautious when dealing with anyone you've met online. They use dating websites, Craigslist, social media, and many other sites to, to reach potential targets. They can feel quickly like a friend or even like a romantic partner, but that is part of the con to get you to trust them. And don't believe everything you see. Scammers are great at mimicking official seals, fonts, and other details. Uh, just because a website um, or email looks official does not mean that it is. Even caller ID can be faked. Um, if you're ever in doubt, hang up, look for their website and call the number back that comes up on their page. Like this little picture shows here, you wanna look for the HTTPS there with that little S. And when you when you have that, the, the web address will show up with a, a lock. So you can see that on this screen, um, maybe. Up, I don't know if you can see the URL, but if you can, there's the, the HTTPS and that little lock right up there that shows me that that website is secure. Next is something that I see quite often, which is pressure to act immediately. Um, scammers thrive on making you feel rushed and hurried in a way where you would make a decision uh, out of maybe desperation that you would never normally make. Um, this is something we see a lot with online shopping, but also we see it with people calling from like the Social Security Administration and saying there's a warrant out for your arrest or you... Um, you're going to lose your benefits if you don't give me a call back and give me XYZ information. Like we see that a lot uh, where they, they try to pressure you into being afraid and acting immediately. They try to make you think something is, is super important uh, and they want to push you into action before you have time to think about it or discuss it with a family member, with a friend, or maybe a financial advisor, or even to sit back for a moment and, and work through it in your mind and say, oh, you know what, that, that doesn't make sense. Why would the social security be calling me about a warrant out for my arrest if I've never heard anything about that before? And a good thing to know is that government uh, websites, government entities, organizations basically never call you. If they need something from you, they'll send you a letter. And when they send you letters, you know, they those can be fake too. Everything can be, honestly, but you have a much better chance in a letter of looking through and seeing um, something maybe that concerns you. And then you can go to a new, you can go to a website and look it up and call them from the website and not from the information that they gave on the letter if you're ever concerned. But yes, don't be pressured to act immediately. Take time to think. It's always really worth it. It's always so worth it because you will you could save yourself so much heartache, time, money loss with just taking an extra like half an hour. So if somebody calls you or shows up at your door and says, oh, there's a leak in your roof or, oh, your air conditioning is going bad. There's going to be like a huge emergency if you don't get that fixed. Um, take a moment and step back and think about what they're asking, what they're wanting, and if it seems legitimate or not. And then whenever possible, work with local businesses um, when there are things like uh, you need you when you need help, like say with tech support or uh, investing or anything like that. Your best bet is to go somewhere that has a brick and mortar that you can show up to that has a, a place with an actual address that isn't just like sometimes we see businesses give out addresses and their addresses to empty office buildings. They're and they're. Um, post office boxes uh, or like UPS shipping places or virtual offices that don't have uh, physical like people in there. And local businesses that you can go to, not only does it help the local economy of Utah um, and your area, but it also gives you peace of mind. You can walk in there, they'll usually have their licensing up on the walls, especially if you're going somewhere like uh, with financial investing or anything like that, uh, insurance. Um, you can check all that stuff online beforehand too. And 
contractors who are going to be in your home dealing with sensitive information or uh, walking through your private areas, you want to make sure beforehand that they have identification, licensing, and insurance. Um, and you can you can find all of that information online. Um, there is a, a website I want to show you. It's called the Department of Professional Licensing. And here you can search a person, like let's say John Smith. And you can see every John Smith that has a license, whether it's active or expired or anything like that. Um, you can also look up business information. Like let's look up, let's see, what's a Utah business? Vivin is a Utah business. And you can see which part active, you know, and where they're they're registered and, and things like that, which is very cool. You have all that information because the state wants to make it easy for you to uh, to trust what you're what you're looking at. You can also look at businesses on bbb.org and see their ratings and their reviews. All right. So let's look here at some factors that affect the likelihood of losing money. So we have some factors that de decrease your risk. So asking questions, if you're unfamiliar with something, ask a question, don't accept the person's word is truth. So if a contractor comes up to you and says, uh, your roof is leaking and it's gonna break in a month if you don't get it fixed, um, take a minute, you could look for other opinions, you can get quotes, you can have somebody professional, uh, some other professional come out and look at it. Um, if somebody says, um, I'm going to give you this great deal on a loan with investment rates at, you know, some percentage, and you can say, I'm not familiar, is that like a good percentage? Is that something that I need? Is that something that will be good for my credit or whatever? Uh, ask questions when you're unfamiliar with something. Um, you can also decrease your risk by believing individuals can influence and empower your own life. So look at that for a second. Believing individuals can influence and empower your, their own lives decreases your risk. How can you empower yourself? You can empower yourself through doing research, through education, uh, and believing that, you know, I believing that not everything you hear is true and that you can make up your own mind and that you have the capabilities uh, to make the best decisions for yourself. Another factor that decreases risk is believing government institutions get their authority from individuals. So if you get a phone call, say, from a government agency and you believe that government agencies are the scary imposing presence um, that, you know, are these unfallible, untouchable organizations. You're more likely to be afraid if you hear that there's a warrant out for your arrest or that you owe money to the government. Um, if you can have that kind of grounded view, it's less scary when things like this happen to you and it makes you realize that there are actually real people behind these government you know, names and that you can access that as a citizen, you have rights to that. And then lastly, factors that decrease your risk is being skeptical when dealing with new situations. So it's sad that in this day and age, you can't really be naive. Um, unfortunately, with the explosion of social media and the internet, you have to be a savvy consumer in order to really survive uh, and keep your money in this kind of a world. So being skeptical when you are dealing with new things can kind of seem a little bit of a bummer sometimes, but it will help you in the long run to avoid scams. And then let's look at the factors that increase your risk of losing money to a scam. So feeling financially distressed. That's one we talked about just a second ago with um, feeling pressure, feeling desperate. If you're feeling pressured or desperate or in distress, uh, you will ignore red flags that financial comfort would uh, would make really obvious to you. So we will forgive a lot of things a lot of times because we, we want it to be true. I've had people call and say that they won, um, that they, they got a phone call that said that they won the publisher's clearinghouse, you know, huge sums of money and that they only have to pay 
$5,000 and then they get the other million or whatever it is um, into their account. And they'll ask me, this is a real conversation I had. <laughs> a woman asked me if it was real. And I said, no, did you, did you even enter the contest in the first place? You know, did they, they show up to your door with that giant check and the camera crews and everything like that? Did that happen? And she just refused to believe me that it was a scam because she wanted it so badly to be true. And because she had already lost money, giving them money. So she had given them like $500 and then they told her that the next payment needed to be like 10,000. And, you know, it's really easy to just kind of have that cognitive dissonance where you just don't want something to be true so badly that you basically ignore all of the red flags. Um, another factor that increases risk is feeling lonely. This one is sad for me because a lot of us have been feeling really lonely during the pandemic. Uh, we've been cut off, I think, from a lot of our friends and our family and from situations where we would normally go out in public and interact with even possibly strangers. Um, and that uh, we can sometimes feel really distanced from people. Um, I know for me, we started working from home and uh, it's been strange not having coworkers to sit next to me. I mean, besides my dog, but he doesn't talk much. <laughs> and then, um, you know, um, scammers want that. They want you to feel lonely and they want you to feel isolated. We had somebody call in the other day who said that they told their family about this man asking them to send gift cards. They told their family and then they told the scammer that they told their family. And the scammer said, don't tell your family anything that we talk about. Like, and tried to blackmail them basically into keeping them isolated away from their family into keeping them lonely. A lot of times, especially with romance scams, people feel lonely and they seek uh, relationships and they can fall uh, really hard for people who are out there to do them harm. Lastly, panicking during finance or during stressful situations can increase your risk factor. That's also kind of with the feeling financial distress and feeling uh, desperate, feeling out of uh, control of something in your life that can lead you to ignore red flags. But panicking during a stressful situation, I think is even more so important. Like if you do get that call from social security that says you owe them money or that you, there's a warrant out for your arrest. If your tendency is to hear that kind of thing and freak out, um, you're much more likely to lose money than if you can take a second step back and, um, and, and think about what you're actually being asked to do. Okay, so let's talk about what to do when you're a victim of identity theft. So the Federal Trade Commission recommends that you create an ID theft report uh, if your ID is stolen. And I have the link right there. And as you will see, we have the HTTPS there, and then it ends with the .gov. Uh, so if I were to send you that website, you would be able to look at that and say, yes, that looks like a legitimate website and with good, uh, be able to basically click on that in good faith that nothing is going to happen. Um, you can click that uh, or go to that website. If you end up having your identity stolen, they will walk you through a, a process of what to do. In fact, let's go there now. So here they give you all sorts of information. They can tell you, you, I mean, it's really just as easy as clicking the huge button, but they talk to you about recovery steps. They can give you um, an overview of how it works. So you can look exactly, they, they, they specify it down here and it just gives you a lot of options, a lot of really easy steps on how to, um, how to begin recovery after your identity is stolen. Um, this will help you. So filing this report is actually really important because it will help you um, deal with the credit reporting agencies and companies uh, that extended credit to the identity thief in use of your name. So first report the crime to the FTC. That's the link that you would do so on. And then you wanna print a copy of the details. Um, this detailed report, report is called an ID theft affidavit, and then you can file the crime report with your local police department and get a copy of that report, and then together your ID theft affidavit and your police report make up the entire ID theft report that you can do. Uh, you can file, so file with your local police, but you can also file with the police department in the location of the scammer. So if you, for example, 
know that there's say you're a target of, of a romance scam and you know that the victim lives in um Washington state. You can call the Washington, like their local Washington police department and file a report there as well. Um, you need to keep the records of all of your cases, police reports, supporting documents, uh, and these may be needed by your credit card companies or banks to prove that uh, it wasn't you who opened that line of credit, who made those charges or whatever it may be. Um, you can also make a report to the Internet Crime Complaint Center. And then the next step is to place a fraud alert or a freeze on your credit reports. You need to contact the fraud departments of each of the three major credit identity uh, or credit reporting agencies. Let them know you've been a victim of identity theft and ask questions, including what protection is provided, if there are any costs, to determine uh, whether a fraud alert or a freeze is better for your situation. Uh, you want to notify all of your credit grantors and financial institutions. Check the status on your existing accounts as they also may have been jeopardized. Find out if there is any unauthorized activity uh, or new accounts that have been fraudulently opened in your name. You may be advised to close some or all of those accounts. Uh, you need to, in all cases, create new passwords and check your and change your pins. And then you need to monitor your credit. So check your credit report. Um, you're entitled to one free annual credit report from each of the three credit bureaus. Uh, one, one a year. All right, and then lastly, I wanna talk about shopping safe online because that was such a big deal over the last year. And because that is one of the top three riskiest scams for older adults, um, online shopping really experienced a huge boom during the pandemic because many brick and mortar businesses began or improved their efforts in uh, creating an online shop. Um, We've seen lots of ads for great online deals everywhere, tempting consumers with great prices or free shipping or what have you. Um, and scammers have preyed on these online consumers taking advantage of hard to find items like when we ran out of cleaning and uh, safety supplies at the beginning of the pandemic. Masks were something that we saw a lot of people trying to buy like the best mask, the nicest mask, the most safe mask that will protect you from really anything in the whole world um, getting, we saw those people getting scammed. Um, we've seen fake websites and we've seen counterfeit and substandard products, uh, fakes offering them at too good to be true prices. And then some consumers of course find that what they ordered is not necessarily a scam, but it's not exactly what they were expecting or the quality isn't as good as they hoped it would be. Um, many of these companies are overseas and will take months to ship your product to you. And uh, they don't state, of course, any of that on their website. You can get a pop-up ad with enticing gadgets or cute merchandise or items with, you know, the I gotta have it messages uh, that make it irresistible to click on and check it out. But unfortunately, some of these companies aren't quite what they seem. Some consumers find that once an order is placed, you won't ever get the product. And because sometimes they will say, oh, there's been delays with COVID, so it'll be another month or it'll be another two weeks. And then they string you along and string you along. And before long, you've passed the credit card window of getting your money back and filing a charge back. So let's talk about some tips for how to avoid um, those scams and to shop safe online. So number one, you want to know the advertiser. Some of the best deals are only available online, but you have to be careful. Like we've mentioned before, it's easy for a fake site to mimic uh, the real thing. So you want to make sure you're shopping with a legitimate site. If the site is missing contact information, that's a red flag. If they don't have an address that leads to a real place, that's also a flag, red flag. Some shops are fully online, but they still have to have addresses and you want to be wary of, of that. So if you find an address that's an empty field, you know, that's a that's a pretty big red flag. And you want to actually take the time to look at this stuff. Uh, like we've mentioned, check the site security settings. It should start with the HTTPS and include the lock icon on the purchase or the shopping cart page. And, um, you know, be a savvy shopper. When reading, when shopping online, take your time and read uh, the fine print look for the return policy. You know, you might not buy something if you find out that they don't accept returns. And although many online orders can be returned for a full refund, some have restocking fees, some won't return or replace your money unless you return it within like a day of getting it. Um, you have to look that stuff up and know beforehand. So you have to, you know, know before you buy. 
And then of course you wanna protect your personal information. You wanna read the privacy policy and understand what personal information is being requested and how it will be used. If they don't have a privacy policy, that's a huge red flag that it could be a scam. But if they do, you wanna make sure you're reading it because sometimes it will just say in there, we give, we share your information with third parties um, who will use you for advertising basically. Uh, again, you need to be, you need to think before you click, especially be cautious about email solicitations, online ads on social media sites. I would say that Instagram scams are one of the most common and Facebook scams where a shop will be selling something on the Facebook marketplace or, or through a Facebook or Instagram ad. And um, I honestly will never shop through a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad because I've seen so many people get scammed from that. And part of that is because they're offering deals that are too good to be true. So they might be free shipping, anything like that, low cost, hidden costs, um, or you might end up, it might be true. You might get a free sample, but you also might be signing up for a subscription service that you didn't know about. We see that all the time with weight loss supplements and keto things, things like that, where somebody signs up uh, for a free sample and then suddenly they're being charged $100 a month to receive a box of these of these things. So you need to read the fine print. Um, beware of phishing. We've talked about that a little bit. It can look like a message from a well-known brand, but they can have a bad link or an email address that isn't their official email address. So don't click on it if you don't know what it is and if you got it unsolicited. In all cases, my top, if you remember nothing else, remember shop with a credit card. Um, in cases of fraudulent transaction, credit cards provide protection. It's so much easier to dispute charges that you didn't approve or to get your money back if there's a problem. Debit cards, prepaid gift cards, or prepaid cards, gift cards, uh, they don't have the same protections. And it's just frankly so much harder to get your money back um, if you don't use a credit card. So in all cases, only, really only use your credit card. It's just so much, so much better for you um, protection wise to use a credit card. And then of course you wanna keep documentation of your order, save a copy of your confirmation page. If you get an order number, um, email confirmation, you know, keep that until you receive the item and uh, are satisfied with it. Um, keep the return policy if you can and your purchase records. According to the FTC, when you shop online, sellers are supposed to ship your order within the time stated in their ads or within 30 days if the ad don't, doesn't give a time. If they can't ship within the promised time, they have to give you a revised shipping date with the chance to either cancel your order for a full refund or accept a new shipping date. Okay, so that concludes the presentation. I appreciate everybody listening. If there are any questions at all, I am absolutely happy to answer them. Um, if anybody has any. If you did want to just chat your questions, I can uh, kind of moderate some of those as well. If that's, if people are interested rather than unmuting and asking, you can chat For those sure. questions as well. In the meantime, um, I will just reiterate some of the things that I said, which is that there really is no shame in being scammed. Um, it happens to everybody. Uh, and the more you know, the better protected you are. And you can help not only yourself, but friends and family. I've had people in my life, uh, this most recently happened with my father-in-law who wanted to it was his birthday coming up and he wanted to send out what he wanted. And so he sent out a bunch of links to these shirts that he thought were cool. And, um, you know, I was able to say, this looks suspicious because the URL didn't have the HTTPS. Uh, the link was really long and confusing. The website had bad grammar and uh, didn't seem like it was made in the United States. The photos on the website were really, really different. Uh, and usually a brand, a good brand, will try to have some continuity there where it all looks like it came from the same photographer. If you see a website with a bunch of different photos that look like they came from all over or heavily edited or anything with filters, uh, that, that's a red flag. And I was able to help him out with that. Um, and my husband is now very scam savvy as well because he hears me go, ah, that's a scam. That's a scam all the time. So it's good to know, not only for you, but for other people. And they're really uh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about if you get scammed. Just want to make sure that you take steps to 
help yourself be protected in the future and also to help other people from falling from this falling victim to the same scams you can report it to the ftc uh, you can also report them to the better business bureau we work with law enforcement and the media to make sure that any scams that we get uh, are being forwarded to the proper authorities and that people are being made aware so there's lots of information out there for you hopefully this was a concise enough presentation that it didn't overwhelm um but you know I, you're not expected to know everything but just hearing it and hopefully hearing it again something stuck hopefully that will that will help you out uh, from getting scammed in the future all right, it didn't look like we had any questions. So thank you so much, Britta, for your presentation. We really thank appreciate you. you presenting to us. And we will be, this will be um, up on our YouTube channel tomorrow as well. And we'll send out that link to, to anybody who maybe was registered and didn't, wasn't able to attend, or it will be available for future viewing as well. Um, just as we wrap up, we wanna encourage, we do have a brief survey about today's presentation. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that in there. You look, it's safe. It's got the HTTPS. So this is this is a survey for the um, SMP program. So if you just go ahead and do that survey, it's about an eight question survey really quick, just to kind of get some feedback on today's presentation. Um, and we encourage everybody, if you're not already registered for our next lecture, we do have another lecture coming up October 12th. This will be... Um, Dennis Del Pizzo of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and he's going to be talking about healthcare coverage for older adults, whether that's through Medicare, Medicaid, or the health insurance marketplace. So again, that's October 12th at 10 a.m., and you can register for that on our website. So again, we just want to thank everybody for coming. Go ahead and click that link on the survey, and we hope to see you all next month at our next lecture, and have a great day, everybody.